Καλησπέρα σε όλους. Ε, έχουμε την μεγάλη τιμή να έχουμε τον κύριο Εξαδάχτυλο, ο οποίος είναι καθηγητής, διευθυντής και chairman στο Πανεπιστήμιο της Βέρνης, ο οποίος θα μας μιλήσει για τον δρόμο που έχουμε να περάσουμε με, το, με την πανδημία COVID-19 ακόμα. Ορίστε. Ευχαριστώ πάρα, πάρα πολύ για την ευκαιρία να παρουσιάσω λίγο την εικόνα του COVID στην Ελβετία και στην Ευρώπη σαν Έλληνας του εξωτερικού. Επιτρέψτε μου να δώσω την, την παρουσίαση στα αγγλικά σε μία από τις μητρικές μου γλώσσες. Θα, θα μου είναι πολύ πιο εύκολο. Ε, κάποια slides θα είναι στα γερμανικά, αλλά όλοι μιλάμε μια κοινή γλώσσα ό,τι αναφορά τα abbreviations και θα τα, θα τα εξηγήσω και είμαι σίγουρος ότι θα τα καταλάβουμε. Ε, so, let's start. So, COVID-19 in Europe, the rocky road to recovery, and it's far from over. And basically, it's not so much time ago that uh, the whole story has started. Uh, around Christmas last year, China reported the first cases of coronavirus disease. So in the Wuhan province, somewhere in China, the majority of us never heard about where's Wuhan, very far. Someone ate bears, apparently, and catched a very, very funny and strange and exotic disease. So why should this bother us? You know, the story has taught us differently. Now, it is a, it is a disease we knew also in the past. It's close to other coronavirus diseases. But at the end, it has become one of the biggest and most severe pandemics with one of the most gravest socioeconomic impact uh, we, have, uh, we have met so far. Just this slide to remind us how Europe looked like during the lockdown, which has the lighter the color in blue is, the less traffic and mobility was observed. So basically, virtually, Europe came to a standstill. Now, just as an introduction, I'm not an intensive care physician. I'm an emergency physician by training, and I'm not an expert. As one of the great writers uh, has said once that an expert is someone who knows much about the past, but not much about the future, because if he would know a lot about the future, he would not be an expert, but rich. So basically, this is the big dilemma we are facing at this moment, that no one of us can look into the future. And we have to assemble the picture of this disease from different bits and bytes of, uh, of research of higher or lower quality to get the whole picture. But there, if someone says he's an expert, then you really, really stay, stay far because there is no such thing at this stage. Switzerland, just to give you a little, a little idea how everything started, we officially tested the first positive COVID patient in February uh, 2020, mid-February. February 28th, the, uh, the Swiss government declared a special situation in Switzerland. And uh, on March 1st, uh, we launched a campaign how to protect ourselves against the new coronavirus. March 11, WH declared officially uh, corona as a worldwide pandemic. Just to reflect, 
This is only a couple of months ago, and, and, and there has been so much uh, in between happening. We had an extraordinary situation until the beginning of May, and most emergency measures known as a lockdown were lifted on May 11. And then what happened? Summertime all over Europe, and the living was easy, and we wanted to forget that the virus is still around. But COVID hit back, and now we are paying the bill. Just some numbers from yesterday. As you can see, worldwide cases, registered cases, nearly 45 million, over or nearly 1.2 million people have died in Switzerland, which is a country of size and population comparable to Greece. We had around 136,000 cases and about 2,000 uh, uh, patients died officially uh, from, uh, um, from COVID-19, much more compared uh, to Greece. We have at the moment a positive rate of 20 point of 26.6. How is the you know the positive rate in Greece at this stage? 4.4. Uh, 30. 4.4. 4. That's that's much less. Okay, so it's 26.6, and per day around 30 patients are dying in our hospitals. So this is quite quite a number. Now, in epidemio the epidemiologists say that when we look at this positive rate, this rate is wrong, because what it means is that we do not test enough. Because usually the positive rate, whatever we do, is around 5 to 7%. So 26.6 means there is not enough testing in Switzerland, and this is a problem. At this stage, we don't have easy access to testing. Uh, patients who want to get tested wait up to three hours, four hours to get to get a PCR, to get a PCR test, and this is too long. So Switzerland uh, di did not prepare well for the for the second wave. Now, how bad is the situation? Um, it really depends on on how you read statistics. There's one of our great Greek fellows uh, abroad, is John Ioannidis. Uh, most of them know you. He is also very well known in Switzerland. And, uh, and he refers to a global infection fatality rate of 0.15 to 0.2%. That's very low. That's comparable, for example, when we, when we look at the US, to the deaths from lung cancer, the annual lung cancer death rate. So it's not so high, and it's even lower in those below 70 years. But can we look at numbers this way, or, is, or do we have, so, so within, through the lens of an epidemiologist, or do we have to look at these numbers through the lens of a, uh, of a, of a clinician? I think in the middle somewhere is the truth. And why? Because comparing data from country to country is extremely difficult. It is as difficult as comparing our economies. So comparing Greek economy to, to a German or Swiss economy is as difficult as comparing our data, okay? Because what you want to know is why one country is doing than the other. And it's not about numbers only, because, for example, many countries, many different ways to count deaths. France and Germany, for example, have been including deaths in care homes for elderly. In, in their headline numbers, they produce every day. Other countries don't. England, the UK, for example, referred only to deaths in hospitals until April 29th. 
Okay, so and there is no accepted international standard or, on how you measure death anyhow. Is somebody, uh, should we include someone who was, was tested positive or someone uh, who was not tested but uh, has been suspicious? Etc., etc., etc. So counting deaths from country to country differently. Population factors. Population epidemiologists don't look uh, at population factors from country to country. So, for example, the UK tries to compare itself all the time with Republic of Ireland, but Ireland has a much lower population density and a much larger percentage of pe people living in rural areas and having social distance anyhow. So it makes more sense to compare Dublin, for example, with the same size uh, uh, cities in, in, in the UK. And it's better if we do comparisons to compare London with New York, but not the UK with Germany, Switzerland, uh, or Greece. And of course, you can't compare, for example, Europe in Africa, because in Africa, the population is so much younger compared to Europe. Different health services. Different health services. We have different health services, and the health service is, is one of the, of the biggest bottlenecks when it comes to, uh, to, treating, to treating ICU, ICU patients. Countries like Germany, with a huge network of, uh, of hospitals, and uh, with, uh, with a huge number of ICU beds, never had problems to care for uh, patients um, uh, suffering from uh, uh, COVID-19 associated uh, illnesses. So healthcare, so you can't compare a, a country like Switzerland with, a, with an extremely high developed uh, uh, healthcare system to its neighboring country, Italy, where hospitals are, have a different standard uh, and a different uh, uh, setup uh, compared to Switzerland. Testing strategies across Europe. In retrospective, only a few countries developed testing strategies timely. And one of the most interesting, interesting facts is that in countries, so this is the last sentence there, the number of tests per head of population may be a useful statistic to predict lower fatality rates. In countries where uh, tight testing was, was put in place very early, the fatality rate is lower. For example, in Asian, in Asian countries. So countries uh, which did not enough testing at the beginning have higher. Switzerland, for example. Switzerland is, is, is in comparison to other countries, is testing much less. And although Switzerland has one of the highest developed healthcare system in, in Europe, one hour mortality rate is much higher, for example, uh, compared to, to Greece. Remember the 26.6 positive rate to the 4% rate uh, you just mentioned before. This is another shocking slide uh, I, I usually show. This is the response, the early response in Europe uh, when, it, when, when Corona, when COVID-19 popped up. You can see different colors show different measures from sc school closure uh, to, uh, to social distancing. Italy, for example, closed its schools uh, early March 2020. Uh, the UK closed schools by the end of March of 2020. So, and in the meantime, travel was restricted, but still in place, and the, the virus was, was, was flowing around. Okay. Uh, this was the big picture and a little bit of uh, epidemiology and politics, but let's get back to from the 
bench to the bedside. So um, what therapeutic options do we have at this stage? Basically, uh, it's based on three pillars. So repurposed drugs, antibodies, and vaccines. That's what we have. And maybe good faith and praying, uh, if you like so. Uh, President Trump uh, kind of highlighted the treatment options and since then, I think the majority of even non-physicians or health professionals understand a little bit uh, how COVID is treated. So basically, as it says there, is taking remdesivir, dexamethasone, and more. So let's start with the let's start a little bit with the more. So it's about the antibodies. Um, we have heard about uh, the company which provided President Trump very early, even before uh, he, was, he was taken to hospital. So in an extremely early phase, uh, he received his, uh, his uh, antibody uh, cocktail. Uh, uh, just as a reminder, uh, his cocktail included two antibodies. One came from a person who recovered from COVID-19. The other uh, was from a mouse, uh, uh, from a uh, uh, knocked out mouse uh, model. Uh, both uh, target a protein on the surface of the coronavirus that causes COVID-19. And uh, this was the story. You know, he recovered well and was stronger than before, uh, as he said. Now, a couple of days later, um, these news popped up uh, that the NIH, the National Institute of Health, closed down three uh, um, uh, monoclonal antibody, antibody uh, studies, sub-studies, because of no, uh, of no benefit. Now, uh, this is this is quite quite interesting uh, because it it makes completely sense that antibodies antibodies do work, but uh, we clinicians believe that uh, these I will go I will explain you a little bit about the other drugs as well make only sense and can can help maximum. If given, if given, given early, the same here with uh, with this drug with uh, tocilizumab uh, from Roche in Switzerland, known as a uh, as a medication used for uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, it's an interleukin uh, six uh, binder inhibitor. So this is we are taking part. Our hospital is taking part of one of those studies, although uh, first uh, studies like this one here have shown again that it has no benefit in patients. Again, we believe that given early, there, there might be a benefit. So at least there was uh, no harm. Here you see again uh, how we describe a patient at risk that is a patient uh, with a confirmed uh, coronavirus infection or with, high, with a high suspicion of coronavirus infection and uh, should have at least two of the following signs. Fever uh, with a temperature of uh, above 38 uh, grade uh, Celsius, uh, pulmonary infiltrates or the need for supplemental oxygen to maintain a saturation greater than uh, 92 percentage. Now, as I as I told you, I will I will go through uh, a couple of uh, slides in German to to explain you uh, how our protocols work. Basically, uh, uh, the uh, we use or we believe in in, in the uh, in immune modulating in immune modulating medications. Uh, at this stage, uh, it is the dexamethasone 
from the uh, recovery uh, from the recovery trial, which has reduced the mortality in patients. Okay, over seven days, it is a six milligram dexamethasone daily dose uh, over a maximum of uh, of ten days. It is tocilizumab. Um, uh, I just I just uh, I just showed you. We are also taking uh, part in uh, tocilizumab versus placebo uh, study. It's the Coron AC study, and we uh, we have seen some benefit and some harm. Uh, but uh, we we believe, or uh, we believe that the immune modulator there is there is a there is a place for immune modulating drug. Uh, we do not use colchicine. Um, this is a Greek study, also very known. We don't use it. We don't use it in uh, in Switzerland. Just, just we we just talked about this. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, not not big evidence, but also an interesting fact. Initially, we all hoped that the uh, that patients uh, who recovered. Uh, who have recovered from corona, uh, from COVID-19 infection, will have or will benefit uh, from from a from a protection uh, by their by their specific antibodies. Unfortunately, it seems that the antibody levels are fading. Um, this is this is brand new also, and it goes nicely along with observations. Uh, in Switzerland, uh, but but also uh, here in in Greece. So I believe that after one year, the the uh, the uh, the antibody levels will have faded. We purpose drugs. Uh, we we mentioned it. We just mentioned it. Remdesivir, an Ebola drug, well known. Uh, well known uh, uh, from Africa when Ebola broke out. Uh, this was one of the drugs uh, we wanted to use. It was never it was never FDA approved though. But you see, this was uh, this was uh, this was a presentation February in in 2019. So nearly a year before the before the outbreak of COVID and when uh, when the coronavirus popped up. But uh, quickly, the idea came up to repurpose the remdesivir for uh, for COVID nineteen, and it is and it was uh, by far the most promising uh, drug uh, uh, to fight uh, uh, COVID, and the result of its use is the premature termination of the viral RNA chain. And it stops uh, the viral genome from uh, uh, from replicating. So, therefore, uh, a WH initiated trial, the Solidarity trial, uh, was started on these reproposed drugs, and this was the headline a couple of days ago, October sixteenth. Two weeks ago, WH Solidarity finds remdesivir has no substantial effect on mortality in COVID-19 patients. We strongly, and not only uh, not only us, but many others, strongly disagreed uh, with with this with this headline, and also the FDA disagreed and approved uh, on October 22 a couple of. A couple of couple of days later, than the, uh, the when, then when the negative results were published, so the FDA approved remdesivir uh, uh, for use uh, in adults and pediatric uh, patients older than 12, uh, 12 years uh, for the use. Again, we think that if used early in the disease, remdesivir uh, or the benefits of remdesivir uh, outweigh any, any harm. This is our treatment strategy. 
So um, I can go through uh, this slide with you. So how do we use Remdesivir? So um, we need, uh, first of all, an indication, so indication. So, so you need either high suspicion or uh, um, a PCR positive result. You need lung infiltrates. Patient has to be hospitalized so in the hospital and patient needs uh, oxygen. Patient should not be intubated, ventilated, and should not be on ECMO. Okay, there are contraindications, uh, different, for example, uh, any uh, severe uh, uh, renal, uh, renal disease is a, um, is a, is a strong uh, contraindication. Okay, so just, just to give you, what is the dosage? Uh, patients be, get uh, day day one uh, on day one uh, 200 milligrams IV and from day two to five uh, 100 milligrams IV of uh, remdesivir. The other next pillar vaccines. That's another very difficult story. We know that countries like China and Russia have vaccines. We don't. We are still for the search. This is a big mystery. We don't understand really why some countries have, some, some don't. Uh, we, we, we don't know exactly what the results uh, of, uh, of, the, of the use of their vaccine, vaccines are, but I am very confident that Europe will get its own vaccine most probably within the next three to four months. This because there are many countries involved, many companies involved, and there's a lot of money also invested in COVID-19 uh, projects. So you see, so the, the potential treatment options, vaccines, antibodies, antivirals, and, uh, and others just as a summary. Let's go back to the ICU, just a couple of... Uh, of our in-house protocols uh, I would like to share with you is I'm often asked when should we wear uh, FFP2 mask and when should we wear a normal surgical mask basically FFP2 only for CPR during intubation extubation tracheostomy bronchoscopy uh, patients on high flow or patients who need uh, uh, suctioning. Next question is which patient should be admitted? So ambulatory care and which patient on the other side should go, uh, should go to a ward? We actually do not admit patients to hospital who are in general young and fit have an SPO2 of, of greater 90 or do not need supplementary uh, oxygen therapy. Patients who don't have infiltrate on a chest X-ray or minimal chest X-ray also don't need admission to, uh, to the hospital. There are risk factors which have to, to be taken into consideration, diabetes, heart disease, uh, vascular diseases, pulmonary disease, et cetera, et cetera, age, as, I, uh, as I've told you before. So very important because we've, we should not fill our hospitals with young and fit patients, and we should focus on those uh, who need it. Intensive care, which these are triage criteria in Switzerland uh, for patient who should not be admitted to our ICU. These are patients who have a will. A lot of patients in Switzerland have a will. They say, I don't want to get admitted to an ICU. I don't want to end up on a respirator. That's, that's very central European. Patients after CPR without ROSC. Patients, uh, patients with with cancer and, uh, and an expected uh, life expectancy of, of less than a year, patients with neurodegenerative uh, uh, diseases, uh, central nervous system diseases, and chronic diseases uh, uh, 
like uh, uh, New York Heart Association for Child Pew uh, Grade 8, C COPD Gold 4, severe dementia, or in general patients uh, who might not, may not survive the next year with or without COVID. So uh, these are our triage criteria uh, in, uh, uh, because of the shortage. So if a patient gets admitted to uh, our, to my department, so to high care or to ICU, what, what, what do we do? Of course, you know, taking history, is that we take into account the dynamic of the last 20 hours is always very important. But then it's, I'm sure you do exactly the same. So uh, doing, doing bloods, uh, 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 whatever, we, uh, we look for Legionella and pneumococcus antigen in the urine. Uh, of course, we take all the swabs. Uh, we do routine chest X-ray and uh, we, uh, we also do CT scan because we know that the CT scan is a good predictor the severity of, uh, of COVID-19 and uh, as a predictor for the next days. We just talked about uh, before here a little bit of about C uh, CRP, C-active protein. There is no role for, C for CRP, uh, but uh, we use the procalcitonin uh, as, a, as a marker and, uh, and an indicator for the use of, uh, of antibiotics. Um, and we do uh, all sorts of coagulation tests uh, where possible. The dimers still and, uh, and, and rotens. Anticoagulation, uh, we just, and coagulopathy is an issue. Heparin, of course, patients uh, who are on dialysis uh, get, get measured anti TNA activity. Patients. Uh, sedation will, is stopped once, once a day and patients are kept in prone position for at least 12 hours, uh, hours, uh, hours a day. Of course, where those special turning beds are available, the university hospital, university hospitals, we have them. So the, the, they were all bought during, during the first wave. There is no specific role for antibiotics according to our protocol. Uh, only, uh, we only uh, suggest empiric therapy if, there is a, if, if we believe that there might be a bacterial superinfection and uh, if, the, in, if in the X-ray we see more sort of consolidated uh, findings rather than those patchy findings uh, we see uh, uh, at the beginning of uh, uh, of, a, of a corona uh, um, neuropathy. Okay, the rest is what antibiotics we use: sertraxone, uh, penicillin, uh, and uh, if somebody has a penicillin allergy, uh, uh, moxifloxacin. Uh, but this is all standard international. I don't think this is something very different. Um, how about, how about uh, uh, ventilation? Ventilation, uh, we, uh, we use protective ventilation for at least 72 hours. And as I said, depending on the patient, Bauchlage means prone position um, is for 16 to, to 18 hours depending on, uh, uh, on, the, on uh, measuring on the different uh, PF ratios and uh, FeO2s, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, patient, are, of course, uh, have a muscle relaxant for 48 hours, and then we start to, to, wake, them, uh, to wake them up. Okay, if I believe this is something you know. What, and this is also something very important because this is a very, very sensitive and dangerous phase for the patient, the extubation, the weaning and extubation phase, uh, because uh, for the patient, of course, uh, uh, because of the, of the sensitivity of the situation, but for us, healthcare personnel, because 
there is a risk of, uh, of, of getting infected. So uh, this, is, this is always well prepared. And to, uh, to bring down the, uh, uh, the cuff reflex, uh, we use remifentanil uh, or lidoca lidocaine as a short in, uh, infusion over 15 minutes uh, uh, before the extubation. Uh, patient up and then trying to extubate as smooth as possible so that the patient is not going to cuff and to cuff the, uh, uh, his sputum and his aerosol into, into the unit. So this is to protect our, uh, our staff. Uh, surgical mask uh, after extubation for the patient. Standard, what we have stopped uh, we don't do any uh, 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 non-invasive ventilation anymore. So we don't do this because, uh, because the, uh, the spreading in the unit is too big. So, so no, so no uh, NIV uh, uh, ventilation uh, any, anymore for the moment. So current situation in Europe, it's quite messy. As I told you before, nothing has, has basically changed uh, from the first wave. There's a, the only thing we agree all on is that there's a disagreement on what we should do. The only thing we agree on is that we should wash our hands, uh, keep distance, wear masks, and should not party. This is, this is something, but the rest is, uh, is a bis big mistake. And maybe in six months from now, we know more. But at this stage, everything is still rolling. Thank you very much, and uh, all the best. The winter is coming. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Exadakilos. I would like to ask, do you use non-invasive ventilation? Do you use high-flow nasal? Yes, high-flow nasal, yes. Yes, okay. of course. Yes, okay. hi, yes. Have we asked questions? Okay. Και το άλλο το οποίο ήθελα να ρωτήσω, είπατε ότι σε σας χρησιμοποιείτε το Remdesivir και στη μονάδα εντατικής θεραπείας, mm -hmm. αν έχουν χαμηλούς τίτλους CT. Mm -hmm. Δηλαδή, αν τα CT είναι κάτω από 30, χρησιμοποιείτε το Remdesivir yeah. πάλι. Ναι. Yeah. Ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. Ευχαριστώ εγώ. Ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. All the best. Okay.